Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the official Do Good Better podcast. We're so excited for you to be listening today because we have a special guest with us. We have Carrie Buckles, who is the founder of Haley's Hope. And I absolutely love the story behind Haley's Hope. But first, Carrie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm just, um, it's a pleasure to be on. Thank you for asking me. Yeah, of course. And there's a, there's a big reason why we have you on, uh, but we're going to save that towards the end. So we'll, we'll announce that here in just a few minutes. I'm sure everybody knows already, but if you haven't, you're going to want to keep listening because it's a big deal. But first, Haley's Hope, I want to talk about the story behind this organization. Kind of bring us back to the beginning. Um, what kind of made you want to open up an organization like Haley's Hope? You know, I was asked that a couple weeks ago, um, and, you know, I go back to, of course, that, that story of us as a family and trying to figure out why our bright, outgoing little boy at the age of, you know, four, five, and six started to lose his self-worth and started to lose his happiness, and as a parent, I felt like I had lost this little boy once I started sending him to this building called school um, because he just couldn't figure out how to work like everybody else was working. Um, nor could we figure out why he wasn't getting it. And as I journeyed down this awful pathway of hitting brick walls and not having that support or that help to figure out what was going on, I followed this little word called dyslexia and realized that once I was able to identify the reason behind losing my son, as I say, to this um, feeling like he wasn't smart enough or he didn't have any self-worth, and getting him back in a short amount of time using a system that literally taught his brain how to process this stuff, um, we got our little son back. And, you know, learning as I became educated about what this dyslexia was, that it's one in five, um, the thought of another family or another little heart going through what Haley did just, I just, I just, I couldn't bear it. And so, um, you know, I called my husband and said, we need to help more of the one in five out there. And, and that's kind of what started this, not knowing what would happen or where it would go, but it was just out of a, it, it was out of a fear of losing our kids. Yeah. Wow. There, that's, very emotional. And I can tell that, you know, still to this day is telling the story, you get a little emotional about it, but I heard he's doing great big things now. Yeah. Well, and, and he is, Haley <laughs> is, has become a fierce advocate for himself and he knows how he learns. He knows where his strengths and weaknesses are. And really, you know, there's really aren't any weaknesses anymore. It's just, I need to do things a little differently. And, um, he's very proud of what he's capable of doing in all aspects. And it isn't something that we should look at as a disability because it's just a different way of, of functioning. But, um, you know, I often get caught up in the day-to-day -day things that we do. Mm -hmm. um, but especially now this time of the year, when I see those kiddos coming in my door, no matter if they're six years old or they're 15 years old and are broken because of it. It just puts a fire in my belly and in my heart to say, I just, um, I need them to get their, their happiness back. That's just, that's just all this. It seems like it's so simple, but yet so hard for our kids. Right. And I, you talk about being a parent and being confused. I can only imagine how at five or six, not really like understanding why you're feeling this way or what you're going through. Do you see a lot of, like you just mentioned, the kids that come to Haley's Hope, do you feel for their, for their first few times that they're feeling that way, that they, they just don't understand why, why they're having to go through Haley's Hope even? Like they just don't 
it doesn't click. It, it totally doesn't click. And I, I can tell and, and any parent should be able to tell when their kids are hurting and when, you know, especially with reading, we're told so often to read every night, to read every night, to read every night. Well, um, sometimes that square peg doesn't fit in the round hole, no matter how hard we, how hard we push. Right. And we can push for three months or six months or seven years, and it's not going to go in there. So I think that feeling for our kids of, you know, again, why am I here? Because we've tried 10 other things. Mm. Mm -hmm. and I still can't read so what do you what is this going to be different um especially when they get to be older and we just that's why early intervention is so important we need to find the right the right thing for the right problem right away right and so walk us through kind of um what, what the kids go through when they come to Haley's Hope? How do you help them um, from that young age, say, you know, five or six are walking through your door? Kind of what's that process going through the organization like for them? Well, we start with, again, a visit with parents, um, a visit with the kids, just to kind of let them know that we're not testing them to see if they're right and wrong. We're, we're just assessing to see where they're at and making sure if it's someplace that we can finally help them, whatever that is. So, um, you know, we want to see if they can early on identify letters and not only looking at that symbol, but what are those sounds of those letters? You know, mm. what are those early literacy skills that we assume kids know that I can recognize M and say it makes that mm sound. And so then I can read the word man, because I can sound it out. Um, and I, and I think early on, even during those assessments, I find that those kids that are coming in are finding a welcoming space to be okay with needing to learn better skills. You know, we're not pushing them to read sentences and stories. We're not pushing them to make sure you can read that sight word. And you, you know, you, I know you've seen that sight word 10 times. You have to, you should know what that is. Um, I feel like they have a little bit of relief in the fact that we need to meet them where they're at, not where we expect them to be. Expect them to be in second grade, expect them to be in fifth grade, that they should be able to read this stuff. Um, right. We can tell where they're having those challenges and be able to, you know, work with who's sitting across the table from us yeah, and where their skills and their, their weaknesses are. And I love how you said, and you brought in the fact that it's not just, it's not just school. Like these, this is a community as well here at Haley's Hope too, that these kids are going to feel welcome and loved, even if they are struggling that day. Yeah. And again, I think a lot of kids, you know, fear coming, like you say, mm -hmm. they're like, mom, why do we have to go to one more place? And not all the times, but I would say often before they leave, they will say, mom, when can I come back? Oh. And we haven't really done anything with them yet. I think except provide an environment that they feel safe in. Right. That they feel safe to be able to learn what they probably know they don't know. Um, but feel like we can help them get there. Right. And that's really the first thing that we ever see change in our kids is their confidence to not fear that task of looking at a white page with black stuff all over it. Right. And or just yelling their name. Right. Little things that we don't think, we don't even second guess can be difficult for other people. Exactly. And I, you know, it's not just with dyslexia, it's with anything, mm. you know, I, I say if it's diabetes, if it's cancer, if it's, you have migraines, if you have, you know, whatever that might be, um, we need to understand what it is in order to help. Right. And that's all we're trying to do here is find out why are you having troubles with learning to read and write? Mm. And it's, it's so much deeper than just 
looking at those letters on a page. Um, literacy is a very hard skill to acquire if you don't automatically get it. Right. Yeah. And we just need to understand how hard it is for some kids and some people and some adults that still mm -hmm. would be classified as illiterate. Right. But I want to go back to that community piece because I've been to Haley's Hope before. And just to give people an idea really about how uplifting and supportive and encouraging you are with the kids from when they first start to when they eventually leave. When you walked down the hallway, I saw that big wall just full of names and numbers and there was even a bell next to it. Kind of explain that wall to people so they get a better understanding of really what Haley's Hope is all about. Um, earlier on when we were in a different space, we had a wall that had pictures of like a lot of our students on it. And so when new kids came in, they could see some of the other students that they weren't alone. And they'd often say, Oh my gosh, I, I didn't know Susie came here. I didn't know Johnny came here. And um, it was, again, building that community that they're not alone. And so when we moved here, um, we wanted to just create a little bit more of a celebration when they finished like a level or a lesson that they were on. And so we put a bell up on the wall and kind of made the rule that once you finished one, you could ring the bell. And it just became this exciting piece for us. So the kids will ring the bell and everybody who's here cheers, whether they're sitting in their office or someplace else, so it can get kind of noisy. <laughs> um, but I also wanted them to see where they were in the process. And so one day I just took a permanent marker and said, you can write your name on the wall and write the level of lesson that you finish. And so this wall is full of names and numbers of how far kids have gone through the program. So we have many that have, you know, have one through 10 all the way through. We have many that are just on one. So the kids can see, oh, you know, these other kids are on one too, and we're still working towards getting to that, you know, end game. Yeah. I have one, I have one adult student who is in, I think he's in the end of level eight, and he, he is saving his bell ringing and his writing on the wall until he's completely through. Um, because it's such a big deal for him. Yeah. Oh, that's he's still so going to ring the bell. So it's, yeah, it's been a, it's a fun thing. It gets noisy around here. <laughs> it's not all just peace and quiet over at Haley's no, home. No, <laughs> it's not. We like to cheer on and, and, you know, make it a celebration, which it is. And, and I think and the parents come in and take pictures or yeah. take videos or it's, it's just fun. And I think it's fun for the kids too. Like you said, Oh, look, they've been, they were, they started at level one and now they're at level five and like, I can do it too. It's not just adults trying to like encourage you to keep going. Cause there's going to be days where you're going to feel really defeated, but being able to see that wall of all those kids that accomplished all those levels just makes them feel a little bit better too. Yeah, we, it's, it's been, uh, just a bigger thing than we ever thought you know, just them writing on the walls. I always tell the kids though they can't write on the walls at home. Right. <laughs> it's only here. <laughs> only up here we can do that. Only here we can write on the walls. Um, but I just want to ask if a parent is listening to this and they have a kiddo who really seems to, you know, be struggling with reading, they, they are struggling in school, they're, they're kind of just feeling off. Um, and a parent listening to this might be thinking, dyslexia might be a possibility. What advice do you have from them, uh, for them? Should they, should they reach out to you? Um, what, is, what should their first step really be when it comes to getting their kids in an organization? Our website has a list of warning signs that you can take on your own at home and just click through the signs and send them in. Um, I think that is a really eye-opening piece because not only are there warning signs that refer to reading and spelling, but there are many other things, and I always call it that plus of dyslexia, that have nothing to do with reading or spelling, but had everything to do with how um, we function through a day. Um, some of those time challenges, those tying our shoes, those you know, not being able to rhyme, um, 
you know, knowing what day of the week it is, knowing when our birthday is. I mean, some of those things are just related to dyslexia mm -hmm. and we don't think of those things. So I would say, you know, one of the first things is just go to the website. It's an easy way to look up, you know, what might be going on and you can send it in and we'll just give you a call and explain to you what kind of assessments we could do depending on where you're at. Um, I just really want to stress that, you know, we, we look, we look at this word dyslexia as just a reading, a reading challenge. And it's so much more than that. And so, um, we need to kind of look at, it doesn't take just more reading. And I think mm -hmm. parents should know in their hearts and in their guts, um, if their kids are getting it and when is too much struggle too much when do those little kids get sad and don't want to do their homework and mom and dad are fighting and you know um that isn't how we want our children to go through 12 years of their lives in school right. yeah and going into that building not having anything to do with teachers or anything but just entering that building that makes them not feel comfortable mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that it, it is so much more than just having struggles reading. They carry a lot of weight, and especially at a young age, too. They carry a lot of weight, and they don't know what, it's, what to do with it. Right. You know? They don't know what to do with it. And, what, and oftentimes, then we think, oh, they get, you know, um, start to act out in class because they're not getting it. Or, you know, behaviors become an issue. And, uh, you know, there's a reason for those. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily all the time this, but there is a reason that our kids start acting up because we're not, I mean, think about it. We put them in school from eight o'clock till three o'clock in the afternoon, which who knows nowadays what that, what that looks like, but that's a long time to be with your peers in a very public environment and be challenged. Right. That's a long day and a long week to fail mm -hmm. every day. Yeah. I wouldn't want to do that. I mean, how would you feel going to work every day and knowing that you're, that, you know, you're not doing a good job? Right. No, that's a super good point. <laughs> would you, would you like going to work every day doing that? And, and no. somebody's going to say, yeah, that, that was, you know, you have to do that over again. Right. Abby kind of, and no, no, it's not good enough to do it over again. I would just say, Patrick, just, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Patrick. But no, I think that is so important to make sure, like you said, it's 12 years of their life. So to make sure that they are in a safe environment where they can learn and feel accomplished is just so important. Yeah. And, you know, kids love to learn. Yeah. They maybe don't love to learn science. They maybe don't love to learn history, but they love to, you know, in all the little details about it, but, um, we're born to learn and to grow and to, you know, and do new things. Mm -hmm. um, if we take that spirit away from kids, because in the classroom, we have to read those things or write those things, you know, their love for learning is going to die. Right. Just that basic. Yeah. Well, we'll have definitely the website in the show notes so people can go and take a look around and make sure they can get that, that sheet of warning signs, maybe do a couple uh, uh, test runs on their own, just looking for those. Yeah. And then yeah. we'll definitely obviously leave contact info so you can reach out, but okay. The exciting announcement. Oh my gosh. Don't even, you're, I can already tell you're like <laughs> so humbled about it. And I'm like, let me scream it from the rooftops. I'm sure a lot of you have known this already. I'm kind of late to the game. Um, Carrie was one of the women who won the YWCA Women of the Year for 2020. That's so amazing. I just want to like put cheering loud noises in the, in this podcast. How does it, how did it feel to be nominated? And now how does it feel to actually have that title? Um, well, can I be totally honest? Yes, be honest. <laughs> this is an honest floor. Um, the nomination was shocking and I think I was almost like upset. I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like, 
He was like, stop, I don't want this attention. Well, um, and then as I thought about it, I thought, you know, pretty, again, humbling to just have somebody think enough about it to Mm -hmm. even write an application or, you know, to just even throw it out there. Um, Of course, I've known about Women of the Year for years, but never really knew how it worked. And so um, after I got over that being angry at the people that that nominated me, um, which was Shannon Charpentier and then my director of operations, Tracy Denham, who um, helped her. But um, I just kind of thought, you know, this is pretty cool and I'm just going to sit in this and, you know, and be. And um, yeah, watch that night and I just, I, I'm, I really, I'm just, I don't have any words. That's just what I'm going to say is I don't have any words. I, I do what I do because I need to help kids and families. Um, and I, I do it every day because that's what I love. And that's what's in my heart for them. And to just to even have my name in there was pretty, pretty cool. But I'm very, I'm very speechless about it. I think it's just so awesome that here you are every day of your life, just doing this because you love it. And all of a sudden now it's like, it's a good reminder that people are watching you do what you love and they want to recognize you for it. I think that's so powerful and so cool. Um, I never feel like, and I'm not, I mean, I just want to, I'm just doing my work. Mm -hmm. So to have other people um, notice, and like I say, even think about writing that application was, I think it was like, oh my gosh, what's, what's going on here? (laughs) But I'm very, I'm very humbled and it's um, a great, great honor. Um, And I don't take it lightly. I may not be able to voice that, but I don't take it lightly. Matter of mm-hmm. fact, it's, um, I, I am extremely grateful for my family that has supported me to get through this. Haley for walking this journey with, with me because it's been his journey, but I've been walking it with him. And then of course, everybody that's here and helping me at Haley's Hope, it's, um, it is definitely a team effort here and mm-hmm. couldn't do it without them. Well, it's well-deserved and I, I want you to know that and you can totally, cause I'd be the same way. I'd be like, oh my gosh, like this is so much, but just know that it's well-deserved. You want it for a reason and it's because you're doing so many amazing things for so many kids in this community. So seriously, well, thank congratulations. You. you deserve thank it. You, you deserve thank it. Thank you. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for being a guest with me today. I absolutely loved our conversation. Um, So everyone, we have so much more though coming up on the podcast. So make sure you tune in again uh, for the next episode. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks.